Okay, so I just turned the recording on. And um, again, welcome everyone. I'm Joe Armstrong, and this is the June uh, Power Systems Virtual User Group webinar. I want to uh, thank everybody for joining us. I hope you're having a good June. Uh, let's see here. My June has been pretty special so far. Uh, my daughter got married uh, about a week and a half ago. So it's been a great month, and actually my son's getting married in October. So she's the youngest, and the two boys, she kind of prompted them, and the oldest is getting married later. But it's been a fun June for me, so uh, enough of my bragging about that. Uh, today we have a topic, um, cloud. So cloud's been around. It's been growing for a lot in the industry. A lot of people are looking at cloud. Um, companies are adopting various clouds, multiple clouds, private clouds, and, pro and public clouds. And uh, for our power users, this has always been just a little bit of a struggle if you're running AIX or IBM I. Um, the cloud offerings, you know, there's some out there by some third parties. They're good. But IBM really hasn't had um, anything for you yet. So um, that's all ended now. Um, IBM has a public cloud for uh, AIX and IBM I. Uh, pretty cool stuff. And to tell us about it today, we have Jose Paez and Ashok Shemsunder. Um, Jose is the offering manager for um, AX and IBM I in the IBM cloud. And uh, Ashok has been around in uh, power systems management for about 19 years, uh, working from virtualization to cloud to cognitive. And uh, he's currently the cognitive systems management technical lead and is working um, on tools to match the change uh, in the systems that they manage. So Ashok's been around. We actually heard from Ashok. Um, some months ago about the HMC, the new HMC version. So um, Shook's been uh, with us before, but Jose is new. So um, with that, Jose, let me see if I can change this um, into uh, you being the presenter now. All righty. Uh, just have to stop showing off my pictures there. And... There you go, Jose, and we can see your pretty face on the on there too. Thank you. Okay. All right, so you should be the presenter, so you should be able to share your screen now, Jose. I'm trying to see it. It doesn't give me the ability to share my screen yet, Joe. Uh, let's see here. Change role to. Uh, you are the presenter. Um, okay, there we go. I got it now. Okay, just took a little bit. Okay, as I'm sharing, it's taking a minute here. Yep, it there, okay, it's up now. Okay, might be going a little bit slow, so I'll try to go a little easy on the um, on the transitions here. All right, yeah, just put it into, like, view mode or something. Yep. That be helpful. There we go. Yeah, perfect, perfect, Jose. Okay, great. All right, so everybody can see my screen okay, Joe? Everything's fine? Yep, yep, looks Fantastic. good. So, hello. Um Thank you for taking the time out to listen to us talk about AIX and IBM I in the cloud. My name is Jose Piaz. I'm here with the show, and we're going to talk about this offering, what we what we've enabled, and um, and I'll and I'll start off by giving you a little bit of uh, a backdrop, similar to what Joe was talking about. Um, a lot of our client base, you know, we we go through these conversations of of refresh periods, and and when we get to to talk to clients, and they they are having conversations about what the future looks like for them. Cloud capabilities are becoming a bigger and bigger um, part of that conversation. It, it, it's, it's almost becoming a, a prerequisite for just consuming IT resources. We as systems, we have a large client base that rely on those two operating systems, AIX and IBM I, but we haven't internally created anything that, that expands AIX and IBM I into the cloud today. While we do have a few different offerings out there that are similar, um, like you can see in this slide here, like for instance, we have bare metal offerings, so PowerAid bare metal. This is a bare metal offering that's, um, you know, you can you can rent out a whole box for a month. Um, this is different because we are not renting out boxes with this offering. This is more of an LPAR as a service you customize the LPAR. Uh, we have things like Power AI in the cloud. Um, this is just a, an offering that has uh, a, just software that's in the IBM public cloud. And yes, I do know my camera's on. I, I, I put it on, if that's okay. No, I hope it's not a big deal. Um, and then we have business partners that have also included um, power into their data centers to host environments so that they can sell that back to their clients, as well as some other um, 
uh, offerings like IBMI uh, in the cloud. Again, this is uh, monthly um, kind of subscription type models that we have offered in the past. This is different and I'll outline how it's different in the next few slides. And then in the coming um, quarters, we are seeing uh, P9 coming into, uh, into the cloud with GPUs as Elite Spence is offering and, and, um, and I'll, I'll talk more to that right now. So we do have this sort of roadmap as you can see, you know, starting out with IBM Cloud Private, going into this offering here of AIX and IBM I in the cloud, and then that next gen cloud where we have the, the P9s uh, with GPUs in IBM Cloud. So you're seeing this, this intertwining of our, our capabilities with power systems and the network of the cloud. And we're, we're really trying to become more integrated with each other, and we think that this is a really great first step at that. So let's talk about the actual solution. So the actual solution is called IBM Power Systems Virtual Server on IBM Cloud. It's a lengthy name, but um, the, the offering is actually quite simple in what it does. It allows users to come into IBM Cloud Catalog, and then they can create a custom LPAR um, running AIX or IBM I, and spin that up in IBM's public cloud. And when I say custom LPAR, they choose how many cores they want, whether it's dedicated or shared, um, how much memory they want, what kind of storage, how much storage, and then the operating system. We as IBM, we consider this a bare infrastructure offering. So we uh, offer up to the OS deployment, and then the client would self-manage from the OS and up. So let me reiterate that. We are just taking care of the infrastructure, and then the client would do everything else after that, um, that LPAR is deployed to, to make sure it's managed properly and, and take care of it. So we, we are giving plenty of space to our, our business partners and MSPs that, that do have value-added services with infrastructure. Like I mentioned before, the business partners that have hosted their own environments, they do have the ability to come in, add their value add on top, and then just use the infrastructure as a base. Or if you have your um, internal team that has historically managed your on-prem uh, infrastructure, they can also manage this, this uh, infrastructure as well. But we are just bare infrastructure. So let me go into some of the uh, details of our MVP offering. Um, right now we've, we've gone GA in US East and South, so that's Washington DC and Dallas. Um, and in those data centers, they're, they're IBM's um, cloud co-location sites. So we've put a couple boxes in there. So the boxes that we're putting in there are the S922s and the E880s. Uh, the cores, so when you, when you go into this offering, like I mentioned, it is very customizable and you can choose through, through a, a small set list of, of different items and, and how granular and, and how much you want of each one. So I'll go down uh, all the options. So we've got uh, compute, which is cores, and you can go as granular as a quarter of a core up to 143 cores. From there, you can choose whether it's dedicated or shared. This is a multi-tenant environment. So when we say dedicated or shared, we're not talking about a dedicated box, we're talking about dedicated resources. In case your neighbors are being very noisy, you've always got those resources allocated to you. Shared is just, it, it means it's shared uh, across the, the tenants in that environment. Uh, when it comes to memory, you can go from eight to 64 gigabytes per core. They're tied to cores so that we can ensure that we're not leaving out any stranded cores in case somebody were to come in, max out the memory and leave the cores. It becomes very complex for us. So we tied it to cores, um, giving you a total of around nine terabytes of possible memory. Uh, the two storage types that we have are tier three and tier one, uh, HDD and SSD. The quantities are 10 gigabyte minimum to a two terabyte maximum per disk, so you can increase it per disk. And then we've got the two operating systems, AIX and IBMI. Uh, there's a couple caveats here in AIX and IBM I uh, that I like to touch on just so that we're completely clear on what it is to bring uh, uh, AIX and IBM I into the cloud. The first one is the versions. So out of the box, when you're creating a, a VM here in this offering, you can choose from AIX and IBM I's latest version. So for AIX, it's 7.1, 7.2, IBM I 7273 coming into 7.4 um, rather soon. The caveat there is that when they bring their own image, because we do have a bring your own image capability that allows a client to create their own image uh, on-prem and, and then bring that into the cloud. When you create your own image, I'm sorry, when you bring your own image, you have to be weary of, of, the, of the version of it. So I, I get a lot of requests, Jose, you know, I've got an AIX 5 dot something or 2 dot something, you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating with that one. But in essence, what we tell them is that uh, these boxes support up to a certain image, um, uh, version number. So, for instance, the, the, the Power 9 box goes AIX, I think, up to 6.1. Anything 
uh, before that can be brought up, technically speaking, into the cloud, but it won't be supported to the level that the client is accustomed to. So if you bring in a way older image, you know, it might work, but it's not going to have that same level of support that, uh, that these power customers might be accustomed to. Um, okay. Um, and then the other caveat here is when I say bring your own image, you are bringing your own image, but uh, there is, there is a, uh, you know, we get questions around bring your own license. It, it is not a bring your own license. So when you do bring your own image, you have to pay for that license to run in the cloud. So now I'm going to take a break and pause, see if anybody has any questions. So some of the questions in the chat, um, I was trying to respond, but I had a uh, technical issue. Related to dedicated or shared, that's on the same line as processor. So that means dedicated processor or shared processor. That does not mean dedicated hosting. So this is the same model we're used to with micro partitioning on Power VM. The point that Jose just made now about operating system support is that we have no difference in the operating systems we support in the cloud versus on-prem. So today you can Google and find system maps that say which operating system is supported on an S922, which operating system is supported on an E880. Whatever those system maps tell you for on-prem, the exact same applies in cloud. So you cannot run AIX 5.3 in our cloud because AIX 5.3 is not supported on an S922 or E880 system on-prem today. If you want to bring your own image, and we'll look at all this when we get into a demo. When you bring your own image and you bring, let's say, AIX 6.1, as long as AIX 6.1 is at a TL level that's supported on an S922 or E880, that's absolutely fine. There's no issue there at all. So to summarize, the OS supported doesn't matter whether you're in the cloud or on-prem. It matters what the platform is, what the power server platform is, and we have system maps that are documented out there for many years that say what OS levels are supported on them. Now, as far as the processors go, Jose mentioned dedicated and shared. So it's not the, a full-blown model you would expect on an HMC today where I can allocate 0.35 entitlement and five virtual CPU, for example. This is a cloud. We want to align with existing cloud models out there, but we don't want to lose the complete flexibility of Power VM. So we allow you to allocate processor, shared processor entitlement in increments of 0.25. So 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75. As far as virtual CPU goes, every 0.25 processor entitlement maps to one virtual CPU. So if you assign 0.75 shared processor entitlement, you'll get three virtual CPU. We don't allow you to override that because, again, we are trying to maintain more of a cloud-like model. Now, as far as um, the uh, shared processor pool goes, when you use shared processors, you are in the default pool of that host or that power server. We don't have an ability for you to define your own personal shared processor pool. There is the default pool on the system. So hopefully that answers some of these questions around processors. Now as far as licensing goes, um, we'll get into this a little bit later when we look at pricing, but licensing is included with this meaning the base OS license. You don't bring your own license. When you order this, and we'll see this in the demo, you select which operating system you want. As part of that operating system selection, that's where you will be billed based on whether you choose AIX or IBMI. Now, as part of the licensing charge, that includes the OS license and some base LPPs. For your own software, your database software, whatever web server, middleware, ISV applications, 
you'll have to work with those vendors on licensing. This is infrastructure as a service, as Jose mentioned. We are not providing a managed app service. We are not providing applications to you. We provide a virtual machine and the underlying infrastructure. The operating system and any workload running on there is the responsibility of the customer, so licensing is also the responsibility of the customer. So to summarize, the base OS license is included as part of the pricing. You don't transfer your on-prem license. Any application middleware licenses is the responsibility of the user. Now, as far as the memory and CPU goes, again, we're not trying to remove the power VM capability. So DL par is a very basic operation in power VM. So absolutely, you'll be able to resize VMs in this cloud. So you can add and remove CPU and memory, attach and detach disks. And as you do it, you will be billed accordingly. We'll get more into how these systems are configured. Um, I know there's a lot of questions and it would be nice if we could answer everyone on one chart, but I would ask that you have some patience and at the end of the charts, we'll be happy to answer all your questions, but let's get through the presentation. Okay. Thank you, Shok. Um, all right, so I'll keep moving through here. Um, this slide really outlines a lot of the things that we talked about already, uh, just to recap. Um, this is a power systems and IBM cloud co-owned offering, so it's both of our business units working together to bring this to market. Um, again, we have the S922s and the E880s. We're thinking about adding the E980s as we start to deploy in our future data centers and different geos. Uh, this is all going to be done through the IBM cloud catalog, through either the command line or you can do it through the GUI. Uh, it's gonna be available to you, so if you were to go online right now to cloud.ibm.com, um, you'd be able to search for power, or power, and then you'd see a big P for a logo, and that's our offering, and you can mess around with it if you'd like. Um, very flexible offering. Again, it's, you choose all the pieces of it, so cores, types of core storage, operating system, and then you can, you, you're charged by the hour. So if you use it for an hour, you're charged for an hour, and you delete it, you'll get the bill at the end of the month, but it's still based on the hour. So it is very flexible, and you can really spin things up just to test things out and then delete them when you're done. So you gotta delete it um, for us to stop charging. Uh, stopping it is still taking the resources, so that's just getting more granular into how it works, but you know you can go in there and poke around if you're interested. Uh, like I mentioned before, we've got WDC in Dallas uh, set up right now. Our future is to expand into Europe, so Frankfurt, London, uh, by the end of 3Q, so late September. Um, and then we're gonna be going into different geos. So here's actually a, oh shoot. Sorry about that. So this is um, a list of features, but um, you know what? I think I don't have. Wait, give me one second. So let me just share really quickly what the timeline looks like, just to give you a good idea. And I have that in a separate deck. That didn't roll over. Okay. There we go. Seamless. Um, so we just went out of beta at the end of May, um, and then we, we, we went GA uh, just a few weeks ago now, and again, that's U.S. East and South. Post GA, we're looking at Frankfurt um, and also getting that E980 uh, added into there. We have some post functionality, uh, post GA functionality listed here, Terraform Provider, and we really just put this, and I, and I put this here just to talk about our, um, our relationship with our beta clients and our, our base clients that have been working with us to bring this to market. So things like Terraform Provider are, 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 is, is a functionality that helps automate a lot of the work they do. And this is something that we've got through you know, our, our continuous feedback loop that we have working with clients and, and working really closely with our MSPs, both internal and external, uh, as we go into markets. And then when we've got compliance here, you see HIPAA readiness. When you make an infrastructure offering like this, it, it spans across um, multiple industries, so finance, healthcare, anybody can really take advantage of this sort of offering. So when it comes to compliance, it's essentially we need everything uh, just to make sure that we've uh, checked off all the boxes and we, we're able to satiate the needs of almost every single industry that's interested. What comes with this is, is, is essentially a very time-consuming process of getting all that, uh, all that readiness um, approved and, and, and checked off. So what we've done is we've created a roadmap essentially of all the different 
compliances that we're that we're shooting for. HIPAA is one of the first ones, and, and we're, as we move forward, you see SOC 2 and ISO over here on the right. Um, these are a little bit more time consuming, but again, we've roadmapped it all. So if you do have a client or you are interested in it, and you don't see uh, your compliance listed there, you know, it is on the roadmap. What we can do is we, we start testing. Let's start putting some, some um, more test workloads on there just so you can, your team can get acclimated with what it looks like. And then as we move forward and we start to get the compliance that you need, then you can start moving over production workloads. So it, it, is, it is a kind of a, a progressive type of relationship. So let, let's just start off by outlining what you need or what the client needs, and then we can move forward and saying when, when that specific outcome is going to be possible. Um, again, when we look at the geo expansion, we're looking at Frankfurt, and then the, after Frankfurt, the, the ones that we've got in line are UK, Toronto, and Asia Pacific. Right now, it's, it's, it's rather tentative in that we are just moving off of where client demand is. So as we start to talk to our geo leaders, they get back to us and they say, they tell me, Jose, we've got this much capacity that we anticipate in this, in this region, and then that will either move it up or down in our, in our, um, in our roadmap. So if you are interested and you, you think that there is a lot of demand in a specific geo, please reach out to me. If you don't see it here, please reach out to me and we can start working towards implementing that. At least I have all the data necessary so as we go into management, um, I, I can make a case for pushing one over the other. Some more uh, functionality that we're, we're pushing out is uh, integrated disaster recovery as a service, backup as a service, and then Linux. So some of the personas that we've been looking at, um, AIX and IBMI customers. So anybody that's running an, an, an AIX or IBMI workload is um, you know, a user type that we've been studying, as well as MSPs and CSPs, so these cloud service providers or managed service providers that have stood up their own data centers and are hosting that back to IBMI clients. Um, they, they kind of fall in the same vein as the ISVs. Uh, you know, we, we make sure that we work with them, and they, are part of, they were part of our beta program as well as some of the, um, the newer clients that we've been um, helping facilitate into this offering. So they are part of the process. But when we looked at our personas, we really wanted to focus on AIX and IBMI current users just because we felt that any pain points felt by that first user set is going gonna, is gonna to span across all three of these. So some of the quick pain points, and I'll go through this quickly because I really do want to get into our demo, um, is... And, and, you, and, and if you're users of AIX and IBMI, you'll, you'll resonate with some of these points. The first one being um, that, that they feel limited in infrastructure that can't quickly and economically scale. So having to scale out your infrastructure is, is, is time consuming and also cost cons a costly process internally. So having to go through all those hoops to get that infrastructure up and running, it makes it more difficult to be flexible in the market. Um, that's one of the, the bigger uh, pain points that we saw. Uh, the second one is, is if, if the conversations do get to a point where clients are just fed up with having to, to deal with all of this and they, they start talking about replatforming, this is a very costly and time-consuming process as well in, in that you have to migrate while you're juggling these critical workloads. It becomes very difficult to do so. And the third one being that if you do manage to take care of all the other stuff, so getting all that funding, getting the infrastructure approved, there is another hurdle here of, of HR purposes. So getting the AIX or IBMI expertise that's more rare in the field to man all that infrastructure. So what we did is we have these three, pain, uh, these three selling points that we like to speak to. So the first one being a consumption model. This is a very flexible offering. So when we look at being limited in that infrastructure, this is as flexible as it gets. Being able to spin something up in an hour and then turn it off when you're done with it, it really does change how clients can move with whatever market demands they're seeing and how quickly they can start to test out new things and, and, and really be more experimental with their, with their uh, infrastructure. The second one is, is uh, we bring this, this idea of hybrid cloud flexibility. We are still systems. We still sell on-prem solutions, but what we do want is that these on-prem, these, these cutting-edge on-prem solutions are coupled with a hybrid cloud option of being able to run what you want where you want it. So if you do want to have a burst environment in the cloud, you can do that. Or if you want to use the cloud as just the safety net for your, for your on-prem environment, that, that is also um, you know, a, a capability that we're, that we're striving for. This is the, the story that we're trying to tell through systems, is a hybrid cloud story using a up-to-date on-prem environment, and then that facilitates the most efficient cloud environment. 
And then also, this is really huge for our client, our, our, I'm sorry, our cloud counterparts. So we talk about IT, modern IT skill sets, bringing this into the cloud, you know, you're doing this all through the IBM Cloud Catalog. It allows clients to also look at what else is available on the IBM Cloud Catalog and start to look at integrated offerings that could benefit them. And this is a good foot in the door for our, for our cloud counterparts. When I talk about business partners, I do always put up this slide because, you know, they tell me, Jose, you know, we're an MSP, we, we have our own data center, you know, you, you're doing something very similar, it makes us worried. I, I tell them to not worry about this because, in, in essence, again, we are just bare infrastructure like Shok has mentioned. We just take care of the infrastructure. There are a, a myriad of services that our MSPs and CSPs provide back to their clients that we are not delving into. So things like migration, things like backup, HA and DR. There's a reason that our MSPs and CSPs have their strong client base and they, they provide all these extracurricular services that, that keep them you know, in, 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 their, in their customer base that we are not providing. What we can do is give this infrastructure back to our business partners, our MSPs and CSPs, so that they can themselves be as flexible. So if they do have a client come in, instead of having to spin up, you know, whatever they need on their data center, they can just spin up this in the cloud, maybe do smaller tests, um, anything that they need. So we are working with our MSPs and business and, and uh, CSPs so that they can learn more about the offering and, and, and start to see how they can wrap their, uh, their value around this infrastructure. Some of the use cases that we've seen, and this will, this will go quick, moving critical workloads into the cloud, using the cloud as a test and dev environment, and then also moving um, further down the line in our roadmap would be the DR solution that we've looked at. Um, Ashok, I'll, I'll pass it to you if you want to start doing a demo. So now we're going to show you what it looks like uh, live, and Ashok's going to walk you through the, the UI and, and what, that, what that would be like to spin up an instance. Okay. So I think, Joe, you might need to give Ashok his uh, presenter oh, right. abilities. Yeah, just take it there. So, Ashok, did you get the uh, make yourself the uh, presenter? Uh, one sec. Share. Um, it just still gives me the option to share a file only. Yeah, for me it took me like a half a second to come up. Okay. Oh yeah, right here. Wait, that that little arrow. That's not it. That's share content, but only a file. Oh, weird. Okay, so what I'm going to do is, hang on a shook, I'm going to reclaim the host role and then make you the presenter, okay? Okay. Oh, yeah, maybe I should. Maybe I'm supposed to do it. So while we're waiting for that to come up, a couple of questions that I'm seeing. Um, yes, uh, the S922 is considered P10, and E880 is considered P30. So you're going to see that um, when we do the demo. As far as maintenance goes on the OS, I mentioned how um, this is the responsibility of the user. So if you're not used to managing an operating system, if you've never installed a security fix yourself, and this is something new and daunting to you, one of the things that Jose and his team are working on is with uh, partners, uh, such as GTS, to provide a managed application service on top of it. So if you don't want to get an infrastructure as a service and you would prefer a managed application service, that is something that um, Jose and the team are working with some of our delivery partners on is providing that on top of our infrastructure as a service. Okay, you should be able to uh, share now. Should... Yes, excellent, thank you. So, Jose gave a very good overview there, um, and what I want to do is do a demo. Let me, just give me one second here. The buttons are in the way. How do I get rid of this? Let me do that. Okay. Um, let me. Okay, so what you're seeing here is the IBM Cloud Catalog. The way you access this is you just go to cloud.ibm.com. 
And any of you can do this today, whether or not you even want to use our power service, this is something any of you can sign up for for free. The IBM Cloud has this concept of a light account, which is free. Now, you cannot get our power service for free. Our power service, like any infrastructure service in the IBM Cloud, is something that you do have to pay for. So if you are looking for something free, that you would not be able to get. Um, and so what I, uh, let me, I'm just sorry, I just got distracted by the chat just to make sure there's not other uh, questions here. But uh, so what uh, you can do is when you go into this, you would click on the catalog button. And in the catalog button, you're going to see lots of things there. You're going to see almost 200 services, and this is the IBM Cloud. So that's one thing to remember here. This is not some GTS offering. This is not some third-party offering. This is a first-tier service in the IBM Cloud, just like things like x86 VSI, Cloud Object Storage, Watson API, Database as a Service, VMware. This is a service in that catalog you see right here, Power Systems Virtual Server. You can search for it as well. You can just type in power in this catalog and search for it, and you'll see it there as well. And again, we show up under infrastructure. So the first thing you're going to do is sign up for an account on cloud.ibm, and then you're going to need to upgrade that account to a paid account with a credit card or however you want to do it, because again, infrastructure in the IBM Cloud is a paid service and requires a paid account. So in my case, I'm already logged into a paid account, so now I'm going to click on this tile to launch it. Now before I create my first VM, the first thing I need to do is create an instance of the service. Some of you may be familiar with our PowerVC virtualization software, and in fact, that with NovaLink is what actually is doing the virtualization under the covers. But you may be familiar, those of you who use it with the concept of a project. Those of you who aren't, a way to think about this is I may have 100 VMs scattered across the world. So what I want to do is within each region, I want a collection of those VMs, a project. So the first thing I would do is in one of our regions, and as Jose mentioned, right now we support Dallas and D.C. Jose has a roadmap to get Frankfurt in place by the end of third quarter. He's also looking at Toronto and London, eventually Asia Pacific. World domination will come at some point, but not this year. We're slowly expanding this. When he showed you the hardware configurations earlier, those hardware configurations are our initial bid at building these data centers. There's not particularly large data centers. So if you're looking for 5880 systems worth of capacity, you're not going to find it. The way that we're staging these data centers is to build a small footprint, and based on your feedback as you deploy VMs to our cloud, perhaps there's a different platform you're interested in, like a 950. Perhaps you're not interested in our V7K storage, you would prefer a V9K. Um, and so that type of feedback as we go on is what we'll use when we build new regions like Frankfurt or when we add additional capacity to our existing regions. So understand that we just GA'd two weeks ago. So what you're seeing right now is what we've just deployed. And it's not meant to be a final deployment, a final configuration. Okay, so I'm going to choose a region like Washington, D.C. that I want to create a project in. At this point, I don't have to pay anything because, again, I'm just creating a service instance within which I'm going to create VMs. So you're charged per VM. I'm not creating a VM here. I'm just creating an instance of a service in a region within which I'll create VMs. You can add some tags, like I can call this WDC Dev or uh, WDC DR or whatever you want to call it. And you'll see here that we have some information here on pricing. So that's a very important question most of you would have, is how much does this cost? Now, as Jose mentioned, this is a monthly billing service, meaning at the end of every month, you're going to get a bill. However, today is the end of June. 
It doesn't make any sense that if you create a VM today, we bill you for the entire month of June. That's just not fair. So we prorate it. So we actually meter the data on an hourly basis. Every hour, we measure how much resource allocation you have and we report it. This way, you're prorated on the billing. Here, it shows you the per hour price that we would meter you at. And it depends what system. Are you using um, our scale out system, the S922? Are you using our scale up system, which is the 980 system? Um, which uh, operating system are you using? So all that will depend on that here. Now, if you don't want to do the math on a piece of paper, you can click this Add Estimate button. And that'll bring up a pricing calculator. Now, I'm going to admit this calculator is a little bit confusing because what it's asking you for is how many hours do you want to use the service? So if you want to know how much a VM would cost a month, Let's say, for example, I wanted to create a VM on an S922, which is a scale-out system. I want one dedicated, virtual, uh, uh, one dedicated processor. I don't want shared processors, so I want one. One is not the number I need to type in here. If I want to know how much this is going to cost me for a month, I actually need to type in 24 hours times 30 days in a month, and that's the value that I would type in here, not one. So I have to multiply the amount of resources I want by the number of hours that I plan to use it in order to get an estimate. So this is very important because this has thrown some people off and it's unfortunate this is the way IBM Cloud does their pricing calculator, but it is what it is. When you go to create a VM, that's actually more straightforward, the pricing we show you there. But this calculator is standard across all cloud services, and it asks you for the number of hours you're going to use the service. So don't get confused. If you type in one core here, and you type in 64 gig here, and you're going to get some really small charge like $3, a VM does not cost $3 a month. Sorry about that. It's uh, going to be more than that. So that's because you need to multiply the resources like the 64 gig by the number of hours you're going to use it. So if it's an entire month, a month is an average 30 days, you need to multiply 30 days times 24 hours a day times 64 gig, and that's the number that you would type in this box right here. Now, in my case, I've already created an instance in this region um, because this is an existing account, and you can only create one instance of the service in a region. So when I go to my dashboard, when I go to my account and I look under the resource list, I have all kinds of stuff in this account, my cloud account, but what I'm really interested in is right here. You see that I've created two instances of the service, one in Dallas, one in DC. So I'm just gonna launch the Dallas one here, and this is going to take me into the screen, the dashboard within which I manage my actual virtual machines. So I click on that and it's gonna launch a dashboard. Now, one thing I want to mention going back to this catalog. So I mentioned how this is a first tier service in the IBM Cloud Catalog alongside all these other services. The important point here is I have interoperability with all these other services. So for example, if I have an IBM IVM with a database on it, I can stand up a node app in x86 Cloud to consume that data. If I want to play around with some of the new cognitive stuff, I can use Watson API with my Power VM. If I want to copy a Mixis B or a captured image from cloud object storage in the IBM cloud to my Power Virtual Server, I can absolutely do that. We'll look at that in a bit when we look at a chart on networking, how you actually configure all this to work. But the point being here is, we have full interoperability with all the other services that are in the x86 proper cloud. So when I go here, oops, looks like I'm having some network issue over here and I didn't get it. Let me try that again. this. Let me bring that up again.
Okay, uh, while I'm waiting for this to load back up while I log back in, so there were a couple of questions about the configuration that we have. Um, where does this actually run? So this does not actually run in one of our, what we used to call soft layer data centers. In soft layer, that old x86 space, the way systems are configured there is very specific to x86. The way power systems are racked, cabled, the way they're configured is significantly different than x86 systems. So I cannot just take an 880 system and just shove it into an x86 rack. Similarly, there are certain things that are done in x86 that aren't applicable in power. For example, iSCSI is the standard for accessing the SAN in an x86 space, whereas what we traditionally use in power is NPIV attached storage. We have the virtual I.O. server hosting partition. Hmm, I seem to be having some problems here connecting to this for some reason. So in our space, we do things such as redundant VIOSs. So what we wanted to do with this project was we wanted to keep the exact same configuration that customers use on-prem today. So what that means is we don't run in the soft layer data center itself, we actually run in a co-location site, which is a building that's basically adjacent to um, the soft layer building. And so there we're able to do all the same configurations that customers do on-prem today. So any question you have about how uh, is the system managed, we use PowerVC NovaLink, which most cloud customers use today. How do we connect to storage? We connect with NPIV. How do we do networking? We use shared Ethernet adapter over the virtual I.O. server. Oh, that's unfortunate. For some reason, I'm having some connectivity issues here today. Uh, don't know how that's going to work for the demo. Um, so all the configuration that a customer has on-prem today, that's the exact same thing that we have in this co-location site. Now, for storage, we use a V7K, as Jose showed in an earlier chart. It's a Gen 2 V7K, and we will be using Gen 3 when we expand into Frankfurt and other data centers. He showed that we have an 880 system right now for scale-up workloads. We're going to move to a 980 system as we go into other regions as well. So unfortunately, I'm not able to, I'm having some network issues with my laptop right now, so I'm going to have to kind of speak to the demo. But what would happen is if my laptop was behaving, um, you would have seen a dashboard that shows my virtual machines here. And then what I would do is I would go and create a virtual machine. Let me actually see if I can go to our test site, unfortunately, if that works for me there. So there seem to be some questions in the chat about HMC and NovaLink. So I want to emphasize again that this is infrastructure as a service. This is not hardware hosting. You don't go to the cloud and get an HMC console. You are using a VM as a service. You don't access PowerVC. You don't access the SVC. This is infrastructure as a service. So any questions about how do I get on the HMC? Why do we use NovaLink instead of an HMC? That should all be transparent to you. As a user, you create a VM using that dashboard that I'm trying to get my laptop to show, and you manage it from that same dashboard. You don't access the HMC. You don't access NovaLink. You don't access PowerVC. These are all under the covers. So when you have questions such as, how would I do storage replication? You can use techniques such as database or application-based replication from on-prem to the cloud, something like Oracle Data Guard. You can use tools such as Mimix. What you cannot do is something like global mirroring that requires you to directly access the SAN in the cloud. Because, we, again, we are infrastructure as a service. We cannot give you SAN access. So logical replication is absolutely fine. Hmm. Unfortunately, today is not the day for a demo. I do apologize for that, and I'll have to see why I'm having some problems here. 
But um, let me go back to the charts, actually, because we talk about some of the configuration there. Um, let me stop the sharing and switch back to the charts. And I do apologize for the demo. I'm not sure why I'm having some problems here. So, uh, Ashok, while you're doing that, let's clear up um, maybe a couple of things that I saw in the, in the questions. First of all, um, you know, we, you talked about the shared pool and dedicated. So if you're in the shared pool, you're in the shared default pool with any other customer that's in the shared pool. Right. And, and you mentioned that. But what about um, in networking? I'm assuming that all of that is shared too, that everybody's on there. There's no dedicated ports or anything that when you do this and you do your there networking, are, it's all um, shared. Let me ask Jose to take over the screen share because I'm sorry, my laptop is just not cooperating today. I can't download the presentation either to show it. It's hung okay. up. Thanks. I'll make a shook the uh, the presenter again. Jose, Jose, or Jose. I'll make Jose the presenter again. All right. Now, as far as getting any free access, if you're a seller or you're a partner and you want free access, there again, as I mentioned, infrastructure in the IBM cloud is not free. But we do have programs where you could do a POC account, for example, and I would recommend you get in touch with Jose and his offering management team on what sort of opportunities that there are to get access. So let me talk a little bit about that networking question, but again, because uh, I'm having problems with my laptop right now, I will say is when you create a VM, what you'll see is First, you would go and give a name to your VM. That's straightforward. When you create a VM, we actually allow you to create two VMs at once if you want to. Because often you would want to do a, um, a redundant configuration, let's say a PowerHA cluster, an Oracle Rack configuration. So one use case there is that you would want to create two VMs with the same configuration and shared disk. So one option you get when you create a virtual machine is the ability to create two VMs at the same time. Then you have an option when you're creating it to pin a VM. What that means is there's a lot of questions in chat right now on licensing. And that's understandable because licensing on power can be very complex and tricky. Often vendors or ISVs have restrictions that say a license is bound to a serial number, meaning once you have that application running on a specific host, you cannot migrate that to any other host. Now, when I say migrate, you don't migrate anything yourself. This is a cloud, so you don't know the underlying host. You don't have access to the underlying host. This is PowerVM. There's no bare metal model. These are virtual machines. So they are migrated automatically as part of maintenance of the cloud. When we need to do a firmware maintenance on a system, and understand this is a cloud, so there's zero downtime. We have an SLA, in fact, that states we have 99.5% uptime. So if we need to do something like upgrade a VIOS, we have redundant VIOS so that we can do a rolling update of the VIOS. If we have to do a non-concurrent firmware update on a host, we use live partition migration to move all your VMs from one host to another. If a server dies, we use the Power VM remote restart feature to recover that server on another host. So we have all this uh, uh, facilities in place to make sure the VM goes down, but again, Licenses may prevent you from actually using this. We cannot migrate you to another host. We cannot remote restart your VM. So for that, there's an option when you create a VM to pin it, meaning that no matter what happens, never move this VM to any other system. So that's also an option you'll have. When you create a VM, you can specify, as we mentioned, the number of dedicated or shared processors you want, the amount of memory you want. Now, we do maintain a 1 to 64 ratio, meaning for every core that you assign to a VM, at most you can assign 64 gig of memory. So if you assign two processors to a VM, at most you can assign 128 gig of memory. The reason we do this is to prevent resource stranding. We don't want a customer going on a 922 system 
creating a VM with one processor and 500 gig of memory, thereby preventing anyone else from using any of the remaining processors because all the memory was exhausted. So if you have plans of creating a two processor, four terabyte VM, sorry, you won't be able to do that. Now uh, on the billing I showed you on that page, billing is done as long as the VM is holding on to those resources. So when you create a VM, it has resources assigned to it. And as most of you are aware in Power VM, when you shut down an LPAR, the resources are still assigned to it. So this is not a utilization model where once you shut down a VM, it's not using the resources so you're not billed. Power VM still has resources assigned to that VM. So at any time you boot it, you're guaranteed those resources. So inactive VMs are still going to be billed. That's something important to keep in mind. Now let's start to look at networking. You'll have two options for how you can connect a VM to the network. Let's first start with the simplest one, which is public networking. In public networking, it's just an on-off button. You say, I want my VM to be on a public network. So this is this example here, this customer we call Pepsi over here. They're using public networking. So what happens there is we will auto-assign an IP address to that VM, which is the Pepsi VM at the bottom of the screen. And the way network connectivity works is the customer would access the uh, VM IP address and the dashboard, which my laptop won't let me show you, it'll show you what the IP address is, and you'll be able to access it. So I can SSH to it. I can open up a browser to it if I have a web server running. All that public traffic is routed through this virtual router we have here and what we call a direct link. A direct link is a fiber connection from that soft layer to our colo building that I talked about. Remember, power is not in the same building as x86, it's in the next door building. So we have something called a direct link dedicated, which is a hardwired fiber connection between the two buildings, and that's what we route public traffic over. This direct link dedicated is owned by us, IBM, and so the routing of that public network traffic is provided as part of the service. We don't ever charge you for any of the uh, network traffic. So whether you're using public networking or you're using private networking, doesn't matter, you're not charged for that. Now, one of the things is, I don't want to use public networking. That's not secure. This is fine if on day one, you wanted to just create a VM and kick the tires on it. You're fine putting it on a public network. But more than likely, if you're putting some sort of production or uh, some sensitive workload, you don't want to put your VM on a public network. It needs to be on a private network. With private networking, which are the boxes that are called Coke on this chart, there you have much more flexibility. So with that, what you can do is you can create up to eight private network interfaces on a VM. And unlike public networking, which is just an on-off switch, you actually define the IP parameters of a private network interface. So what you would do is you would create a private subnet. You can either do this as part of creating a VM or you can do it outside. If you want to put all your VMs on the same subnet, you'll have the ability to create subnets uh, separate from a VM. But when you create a subnet, you specify a CIDR, a, a address range, an IP address for a VM, a gateway, DNS, all the same things you would when you create any sort of networking configuration and then you put the VM on that. The nice thing about this is you can actually have this concept of bring your own IP. So if you're using a certain IP range in your on-prem data center today, you can create a VM with that exact same IP range. Now that doesn't mean it's automatically going to be able to connect to your on-prem infrastructure, we'll talk about that in a second, but private networking gives you flexibility in defining what IPs, what subnets, your VM is on. Now when I define a private network and put my VM on it, that private network is just within that colo site at this point. 
I need to be able to connect to it now. How do I actually get to that VM? I'm not using public networking like Pepsi. I'm using private networking. So how do I get to that? There's a couple of ways you can do it. First of all, we talked about with public networking, all the traffic between SoftLayer and the Colo is routed over an IBM-owned direct link. In this case, private networking, you can't use that direct link anymore because now that's, this is private traffic. So you, the customer, actually have to allocate your own direct link. But you don't need a dedicated connection like we had for public traffic. You can use a private uh, one or a shared one called Direct Link Connect, which is basically a virtual circuit that goes through a service provider. In our case, our service provider is Megaport. When you look at the documentation, we walk you through how to actually create one of these, what options to choose. But what you would do is create a Direct Link Connect yourself under your cloud account, and we would connect that to your private network in the colo. So now what this Direct Link Connect has done is it's allowed you to connect SoftLayer into the private network in the colo. Now when you're on-prem, this is the box at the top that says Coke, he's outside the cloud, he's in on-prem. What you can do is you can VPN to SoftLayer Let's say that box in SoftLayer that says Coke is an x86 virtual machine. I can VPN to that, and then from that, I can SSH to my Coke private uh, network over this Direct Link Connect. Another thing that I can do is I can, where this box in SoftLayer says uh, Coke, I can create a virtual router. And I can use that to tunnel my VPN traffic that comes in through the internet over my customer-owned Direct Link Connect to the box called Coke. So there's a couple of different ways that I can establish connectivity from on-prem to that private network the VM is on. As I mentioned, you can specify up to eight private networks or private network interfaces that your VM can be on. So that's networking. Now, uh, here's a couple of charts that just show configuration. This is basically the same thing that I mentioned that shows you that the configuration here is no different than what people do on-prem today. So you see here we have redundant BIOSs, we have redundant network paths, um, and so this should be the exact same thing that customers are accustomed to today. Now let's talk about a little bit on storage here. So here's the hardware again. Um, what we have here is a, a smaller footprint, as I mentioned, two 880s and eight 922s. So we have a finite amount of capacity. For storage on the V7K, it's a mix of spinning disk, HDDs, and flash storage, SSDs. And so with that, we have a limited amount of flash. As you see on this chart, we have much less flash drives as compared to HDDs. Again, we were trying to, rather than go and build the most expensive data center, we were trying to understand what the requirements are on the user. And so we don't have a very large environment there. And so if you want to get flash storage that does cost different than spinning storage, it's going to be more expensive. Now, there's a couple of different ways to use storage. This V7K is encrypted, by the way. There was a question about that. When you deploy a VM, we talked about what operating systems are supported. By default, we provide you stock images, the N and N minus one level. So you can get AIX 7.2 and 7.1 with the latest TL. You can get IBM i7.3 and 7.2 with the latest TR. That's what we provide but you don't have to use it. That's just what we give as stock images. You can bring your own image. So if you're using PowerVC today, you can do a capture of a VM, create an OVA file, and import that. If you don't use PowerVC, which I would expect a lot of you don't, you can still create a make sys B. If you're using IBM I, you can create a save sys, and you can bring those in. So this is where that whole private networking with the direct link comes in. 
In order to import anything into our cloud, we first require that it be in cloud object storage. So in the case of importing an image, we ask that the OVA file be in cloud object storage. When you create a VM, all you do is point us to that path where that OVA file is. If you're not using an OVA, you're using a make sysd or a save sys, well then what you can do is you can use one of our stock images. Let's take make sysd as an example. Create a VM using one of our stock images, like 7.1 or 7.2, assign a data volume to it, either spinning or flash, and copy your make sysd over there. Then on that make sysd, I can do an alt disk installation. So that's kind of the same thing you would do on-prem today. So there are ways that you can take a backup on-prem and bring it back to, uh, bring it to the cloud and deploy it there. Now, once you have your VM deployed, actually, let me make one more comment on storage. So I said we have a mix here of Flash and HDD. Boot volumes always go on HDD. You don't have a selection there. The earlier chart that Jose showed where he said you can create multiple disks from sizes ranging from 10 gig to 2 terabytes is applicable to data volumes. So you can create multiple data volumes of various sizes and choose what type of medium you want to use for it, flash or spinning. When you have created a VM, you have it up and running, you have the operating system you want, uh, at that point, you can capture it. So let's say you wanted to clone a VM you put into the cloud. You can absolutely do that by capturing it. So we have an option to do a capture. You select what data volumes you want to be part of that capture, and we'll create an OVA that goes into your image catalog. You have an option of exporting that image to cloud object storage if you want. One note on cloud object storage is that you can go use that today. I mentioned any of you can go to cloud.ibm.com, create an account there and access it. You can play around with it. To upload it, um, uh, you can use uh, an Aspera agent. Um, you can use S3 API if you have some script. There's a lot of documentation on cloud object storage, and that's not our offering, so I won't get into it, but there are a couple of ways that you can upload files to it. In my experience, to upload 20 gigs takes a little under 10 minutes. So I know that some images, like if you captured an IBMI image, that can be 80 gig or larger. So that's going to take a little bit of time depending upon your network connection. But once you import it from object storage, it's in that image catalog. I showed you earlier you create this project in a region. When you import an image, it's part of that catalog in that region. So it's not something that you have to repeat over and over and over again. This makes this B I talked about, the save sys. We have documentation on these processes. You guys are the experts that know more about make sys B and save sys, so I'm not going to go and repeat all the processes here and educate that. We have a lot of documentation on that. So I'm not going to go into all those instructions there right now on it. But there are ways to bring in your backups however you want. Let me go to the next chart now. This just basically shows you what our colo looks like. And the point being here is it's really no different than what you'll see in uh, your on-prem data center. Now I talked about how you're able to do backups, um, or rather I said how you can do a capture of a VM. A question that often comes up is what does this mean for backup? Backup is a very broad term, first of all. We need to be precise when we use a term like backup. There's different levels of backup. It can be argued that this capturing of a VM is a backup. So at a VM level, I can do backups by capturing a VM and its disks. However, that's very heavyweight. And maybe there's databases that I can't quiesce to get a clean backup. I want to do something more at the application level. That's also possible. If you look in the x86 space, typically agent-based backup, that is an agent running in the VM that does a backup of certain file sets, is not part of the base infrastructure offering. It's an add-on that you can purchase. 
They're similar to concepts like that here as well, where, for example, you can use TSM on AIX. You can use BRMS on IBMI. Now, on IBMI, we don't have any virtual tape library in our Colo site. So what you would need to do is for something like TSM or BRMS, you would have to configure them to use cloud object storage. But that's agent-based backup that you're certainly welcome to use. It's just not part of the base offering because it's not very common to do that. Again, we provide infrastructure as a service. So as an infrastructure level, we provide the ability to do a capture or a snapshot of your VM. Since we don't manage the operating system or its application, any agent-based application or file level backup would be the responsible, uh, responsibility of that customer or their partner. So let me turn it back over to Jose that talks about some of the work that we're doing with some of our services teams on enablement and some of the um, information on how you can get started with this. So before you go there, Ashok, let's um, like to uh, clear up some things on support. Um, okay. For example, you know that the licenses come over. So let's just say IBM I, for example, if you have if you have a, a VM on a cloud and you have an IBM I issue, you can call support because um, it, it's handled. But I, I think you give them their your customer number. You can't give them a, a serial number of machine, Correct. right? But you give them a customer number. Correct. So support would be handled for the OS and for the hardware, of course. But any other software you bring over, you have to have a support contract and, and deal with that on your own, right? Absolutely. And uh, one uh, uh, clarification on wording, you don't bring over your license. The cloud license you get as part of this pricing, when we looked at that calculator, you choose your operating system. Part of the operating system price is the cloud license. So you don't transfer over your on-prem price. You're actually buying a cloud license. And you're absolutely correct. If it's an operating system issue, you're having some problem with some application or the operating system itself, you would follow the same support process as today where you would call up uh, IBM support or you would create a Salesforce ticket. Only difference being now is you give your customer number so that they can check the entitlement to your cloud VM. If it's a problem with the VM itself, Let's say, for example, it's in an error state or it's not booting or for whatever reason it's not seeing a, a disk. In that case, you open what's called a ServiceNow ticket. Any of you who have a cloud account, you would see in the upper right-hand corner there's a button called Support. And we provide instructions in our documentation on how to fill that out to open a ticket. You'd open a case against our infrastructure as a service, and then we would go and service that. Okay, now, but something where where it's not with it, for example, DB2. You bring on and load a DB2 database on your AIX partition, for example. How You have to have a license for that somehow, right? Right, right, and, exactly. Okay, and, and your support goes with whatever support contract SWAMA you have with that particular license. Right. Okay. And similarly, like questions were earlier, there were questions about running Power HA. I said how our user model allows you to create two VMs at once if you want to create a Power HA cluster, but Power mm -hmm. HA is software outside of AIX. So you would have to license Power HA for the cloud separately, and the support would work the same as it does with Power HA on prem today at that point. Okay. We don't have anything for like a CBU, uh, though, offering, right, in the cloud? CBU, as in, remind me again what that what that for was. like the, so a backup so it's really a, uh, an HA backup for IBMI where the licenses you're not paying for any licensing fees until because the licenses really just transfer over so there's no IBMI license right you can't bring it. your yeah, own there's license. one I guess right, right. But, yeah so we don't yeah. we don't have really a CBU a cloud CBU offering yet yeah okay. Um, some other questions I saw while I was talking was there was a question that I was asking since I use the word soft layer. Um, unfortunately, I know that's not a word we use anymore. We call everything the IBM cloud, whether it's infrastructure, platform, SaaS. But there was a question about there is an old IMS portal, control.softlayer. Is that where you would go? As you saw in my uh, demo that uh, uh, unfortunately uh, 
got cut short, I went to cloud.ibm.com. You don't go to control.softlayer. If you go to control.softlayer, you're not going to see our service there. You're only going to see it in that cloud catalog, that cloud.ibm.com. So I know I said uh, I mentioned the word soft layer, but uh, understand that uh, that's, not, uh, that's not something you will find in the soft layer catalog itself. Now again, uh, uh, like the point Joe mentioned is uh, on the licensing of software, these are not going to be the same licenses that you run on-prem. There is no bring your own license. So I'm still seeing a lot of questions about serial number. And that's not how it works in the cloud because there is no serial number that's exposed to you. Now, to be fair, some of this is still TBD. One of the things that Jose and his team are doing are working with a lot of these various software uh, vendors, some of these ISVs to try and figure out what the licensing strategy is. But it's all going to be the same, whether it's PowerHA, whether it's Oracle, whether it's AIX, IVMI, it's going to have to be tied to a customer account. It cannot be tied to a specific serial number simply because this is a cloud and you don't get dedicated hosting. Easier said than done, we still have to figure all this out. I do know for base OS support, IVMI and AIX, they're already set up to field calls where you give your customer number, and so you shouldn't need to give a serial number. As far as other third-party software, still working on that, so there may be some hiccups there where you call and say, I'm running in the cloud, I don't have a serial number. Um, are there some other questions before we go back to some of the enablement information? Not that I can think of right now. I'll have to look through the list. So we can go ahead and continue on with the enablement stuff that Jose can cover. Okay. And well, one, one real quick, I uh, just want to reemphasize again, there is no dedicated hosting here. This is a multi-tenant shared environment. So the simple physics of it is when you ask a question like, am I guaranteed the same IOPS I have on-prem? That's kind of tough to say yes to. You're going from a dedicated host on-prem today to a shared environment. So it, the, the, the physics of it says that more than likely, you would not be getting the same IOPS for it. So that's something to understand is right now, there is no dedicated hosting option for this. This is a shared multi-tenant environment. Alrighty, so um, so I'll just jump into enablement, and uh, you might see I've started answering some questions in the in the um, in the chat over on the right. I also, if you're internal to IBM, I've also put a link to something we call the Zacks page. It's something that uh, cloud use, uh, sellers use to outline um, all the details of the offering, including all of the assets, similar to the presentation that we just showed. Uh, we've got tech uh, tech decks. Uh, so the technical seller deck, and we've got the business partner deck, as well as videos on us doing this um, spiel. Um, if you go there, you'll be able to see my contact information as well as the shows. And then I, I also have my um, my sales lead, Lisa Vogelman, in there, and she's she's um, going to be taking a lot of the the, the lead on on any sort of leads that you might have. So for this offering, it is. It is that you, you can resell it through the IBM business part as an IBM business partner. We have an ESA program, and um, it is outlined in, in that Zach document that I that I mentioned. Um, if you have more questions, please feel free to message. So let me put my in the chat. So that's um, let me get you her email. My email as well, so I'll, I'll link us both in there. And if you have next, if you have questions about next steps, um, you know, please contact your IBM rep, whoever your IBM uh, client rep would be, and then we can start that conversation on getting a POC started. Uh, so for a POC uh, process, if you are if you are an IBMer, the way it works is that you essentially go into the IBM Cloud Catalog, stand up a brand new account, you say it's for a POC, it goes through an approval process, it, um, they pull funds from, from, from the GEOs, I believe, and then you're given a certain amount of funding for you know, whatever the use case is that the, that the client is trying to achieve. 
Uh, as a client, you'd have to outline what use case you're trying to achieve, um, how long you think it'll take, and what you plan to do after the POC. With that information, they use it to judge um, if, if they can allocate funds for the POC. Um, if you are an internal team and you're trying to do uh, testing, we are figuring out a process for that. We give uh, up to 55% discount for internal teams to do testing. Um, we have no way of doing a 100% discount uh, as, of, as of now, but we are trying to enable the most, um, the most critical teams right now. Are there, if you have any other questions around enablement, please do drop it in the chat. Essentially, uh, it's, it's reaching out to myself from my sales lead, Lisa Vogelman, to, uh, to, uh, to get that conversation started. So Jose, I'm just looking through the chat a little bit. I'm sure that um, Ashok is too. Uh, there's some questions on integrating it with other hybrid clouds. Hey, Joe, can yeah. you repeat that again? I'm sorry. So there's a question on integrating this with other hybrid clouds. Like yeah, so I one of the things is uh, we have for our interfaces a command line, GUI, and API. So for programmatic integration, you could use the API. One of the things that we will be working on going forward is a Terraform provider. So this would provide the integration point with the Cloud Automation Manager and therefore ICP. Doesn't exist right now. So any sort of programmatic integration you want to do would be done through our API. And in our documentation that you find in our service in the catalog, we have our API documentation there you can see. Okay. So there's some questions on getting back to the whole other um, software that's not provided as part of the cloud that users bring on their own, right, that they want to load onto that VM as, as part of their, you know, supporting their workload or whatever. So for those licenses and in those cases where, you know, the standard license is, is um, that the standard app is licensed by serial number, that's something that they really have to work out with that ISV and that provider, right? Right. Or, and, and they must run into this with other clouds. Providers must run into this with, you know, clouds getting to be pretty popular with other cloud instances as well. But there's no stock answer, I think, that we can give. Yeah, I mean, we are working with some of these partners and ISVs, but there's such a massive ecosystem. Uh, you know, there's, there's a thousand ISVs. We may have like maybe two that we figured out licensing with, but a lot of that is going to have to be driven by users and from the ISVs themselves. It's really tough for us to go and solve everyone's problem. We're focused on our IBM software like PowerHA, for example, and getting the licensing for that working in a cloud model. It's really, we can't go and solve that for the whole world. Right. Okay. But, and Power HA is really a good example, actually, Ashok, because that's licensed. Well, that's licensed by Core. Um, it's tied to a serial number, uh, so we must have something for the cloud for that 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 we work out with our customers. Okay. Um, I'm just looking through the. Uh, the other charts to see if there's anything else that you guys want to cover before we um, before we close. If there are questions in the chat, I can answer them. For some reason, chat I can't scroll through, and it's just having all the technical issues in the world during this V up today. You are. I'm in the chat, but I can't scroll through it. Like when I try and go up and down, nothing happens. Mm. Oh, let's see. My laptop is hosed. Pronounced <laughs> 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 Jose. <laughs> Um, all right, so I've put my information there as well as Lisa. I think a lot of, Joe, a lot of these conversations that we have with clients are going to be ultra specific to whatever the client needs. So if, if you are hearing this talk and you do think of a client or you are a client and you are interested in something like this, please reach out to myself or my worldwide sales lead and, um, or both of us at the same time, and we can start to answer some of the more um, 
unique uh, aspects of, of your workload or whatever use case that you're intending to do with this sort of offering, and then we can start to outline next steps there individually. Absolutely. So, and the presentation materials are on the wiki, um, and the uh, a replay will be put on the wiki as soon as I can get it uploaded and, and all set up. So, and Jose, I'm imagining your contact information would be in the, the presentation materials as well, so everybody can, can get hold of you that way. Yep. I do have my my email as well as my Slack handle and the show's email as well in there. Okay, good. So everybody can get a hold of um, Jose that way, and and like you said, you know, there's a lot of questions that are probably particular to your specific instance. Uh, <clears throat> and I would say that you know, as a starter, going out and and creating a, an account which doesn't have any cost to it, associated with it, you know, and and start that way and to get a little familiar and then um, can create VM. Sounds great. Okay, well with that, I guess we're we're pretty much wrapped up then, right? And if you guys don't have anything else to add? I, I actually, okay, my laptop, I just rebooted it. If we have five minutes, I can actually show the demo. Oh, sure, go ahead. Let me, uh, okay. let me see if I can make you presenter here, Shook. Yeah, sorry about that, yeah. I'm, I think it's actually the WebEx that was hanging my um, laptop. There's too many people on here. No. <laughs> yeah, not quite. All right, so you should be presenter now. Okay. Able to share. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for bearing with me here. So you see right here, this is a dashboard that would have come up if my laptop was working that shows the VMs that we have available in my project. I had talked about earlier where I can go in here and I can create subnets in pair if I want to do it outside of a VM. So I may want multiple VMs to be on the same subnet. So I don't want to create that subnet in every single VM. I can define it at a global level. Boot images. I can go into boot images and this shows that bring your own image I talked about where I can bring my own OVA. You see here that we have standard looking names such as 7100, 7200. These are those stock images I mentioned, the N and N minus one level. But we also have something called NIC test here. This is where I imported an image. Or if I did a capture of a virtual machine, it would put it here. This is my image catalog from within which I can create VMs based on my images. So let's say I wanted to create a new virtual machine. So you see here that you have a pricing calculator. So I know, uh, you know, I admitted it and there was comments in the chat that said the catalog pricing calculator is very convoluted. If you want a more clear indication of your monthly charge when you create a VM, you can use this. So as you can see, I haven't even done anything yet. All I have is a very basic configuration of one core and two gig of RAM. So it's telling me on a 30 day month average, it's going to cost $766. Now we watch the price go up as I type in stuff here. So I said that I can give it a name. I can create two instances at the same time. If I do that, I can say whether it should be co-located, uh, meaning that uh, it's on the same server or more than likely if I'm doing an HA configuration, I want this choice that says go to a different server. I absolutely don't want my HA configuration on the same host. If I'm bringing my own image and I want to SSH to it immediately, I can specify SSH keys. Here's that option to pin a VM because of my application licensing restrictions. My VM can never be migrated to any other host. I cannot have remote restart in a host outage. It has to stay here. So I can pin it. So in that case, if they need a firmware update, uh, is, is it, then you have to take an outage? Yep, and uh, that, that's what we kind of say right here. If the host system goes offline, the virtual system server is not auto-migrated. So yeah, absolutely correct. The implication here is if we need to update firmware, your VM goes down with it. And again, this is unfortunately the byproduct of some of the licensing complications Power has. I can choose my platform, E880, S922. Pricing is different based on which one I choose. I can choose shared or dedicated processor, and uh, I can specify a certain amount. Now, there were questions on IBMI. 
On the S922, we do enforce that four vCPU limit, so that is something on a 922 we do honor and enforce. You can choose the stock image or an image you've brought. In the case of I want to import my image, I choose custom image and I say where in cloud object storage that image is that I want to import to my catalog. We talked about how for boot disk, you don't really have a choice. Based on the size of the image, we'll allocate an HDD of that size. But for data disks, I can choose multiple data disks. So you see here from anywhere from 10 gig to two terabytes, I can choose spinning or HDD, and I can say whether it's shareable or not right here. It's just an on-off that says I would choose yes because I'm creating an HA cluster. For networking, I can have an on-off switch for public networking, or we talked about for private networking, I create a subnet where I specify my own custom IP parameters and I can do a bring your own IP. Once I have this created, if I go back to my virtual server here, I can always go and edit this at any time. And I mentioned earlier, DLPAR is supported. When I go to edit it, um, if I go here, for example, and let's say I added another 0.5 entitlement there, and I hit next, it's gonna tell me, okay, now I have to pay another $60 a month for adding that extra 0.25 entitlement. We talked about all the network connection options, but of course, if you don't have network set up, you just want to open a console or what we call a virtual terminal in AIX, the 5250 console in IBMI, I just click on this icon right here and a virtual terminal will get opened up for me uh, or in the case of a green screen, if you give it a second, and uh, over here, uh, if I had put this on a public network, mine isn't, you see that this button here is off, but if I had, there would have been a field here that said external IP, and that's what I can directly connect to if I just wanna do public networking and not private networking at this moment. But I have my terminal here, and uh, I disconnected it, oops, sorry about that. But anyway, the point being is regardless of IBMI or AIX, I can launch a terminal to it if I don't have network connectivity to it. Similarly, if I'm doing public networking and uh, you can SSH to the IP address there, for you IBMI people, you can launch Navigator against that public IP. And if you want to get any information about what we discussed here, you want to see some of the pricing information, you want to see the documentation, you can go out to cloud.ibm.com today and you can read up on this. So thanks for giving me an extra five minutes to do the demo. Sorry it was so rushed. Actually, it's very nice to see it in action there, Ashoka. I appreciate you bringing that up and, and uh, being able to go through it. That was nice. So, but we are at the uh, at the at the end time for this, though. So um, we will shut it off here. I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us this month. I hope you have a wonderful summer. Uh, especially, I want to thank uh, Jose and Ashuk for uh, doing this for us, uh, this newly announced product, and letting us know about it. So thank you, guys. And uh, with that, we'll just call it a wrap, and uh, see you all next month. Thank you, everybody.